Um, I would like then to welcome our next speaker, Steve Pittman, uh, and give him a warm welcome. He's our Head of Professional Development at the INMO. Um, he uh, is a Registered General Nurse and Head of Education and Professional Development at the INMO. He has worked in a number of organisations in the UK and in Ireland, including Tala Hospital, the NMPDU in the Eastern Region and Health Authority, and for 14 years worked in the RCSI as Programme Director on the MSc programmes in the Institute of Leadership. Steve is a Fellow of the Faculty of Nursing and Midwifery RCSI and member of the NMBI Education, Training and Standards Committee. He holds degrees in social psychology, health psychology and work and organisational psychology. Steve is very kindly going to give us a discussion today on burnout and disengagement. I think education in relation to psychosocial issues is a significant contributor to helping us actually deal with them so that he creates awareness of what exists and what's happening out there. So I'll hand you over to Steve. Thank you very much, Steve. That's great. Thank you very much, uh, Karen, for that uh, um, introduction. Um, and just to say that my um, session, I've been um, listening to uh, Bruce and to Tara, um, will um, complement, um, will supplement, and hopefully add to the discussion. It might be a slightly different angle, but it's it's very much um, talking about the same type of, of issues. So what I'm going to be presenting today is going to be looking at the um, work done within the item over the last um, over the last a year or so, looking at the psychological impact of COVID-19 on nurses and midwives. Um, so I suppose the title is, is Burnout and Disengagement. It's going to be focused mainly on um, burnout because the issue of disengagement, I suppose, is just um, the opposite of engagement. And there's been a lot of debate around that, but, uh, um, but I'm going to focus mainly on, on burnout. Okay, so what is burnout? Burnout is the uh, prolonged, uh, is a prolonged response to chronic and emotional and interpersonal stresses as defined by exhaustion, cynicism and inefficiency. Um, exhaustion is the main um, component of um, exhaustion, uh, of, of burnout, but it's a syndrome that usually occurs within um, individuals that work with people. I mean, that's the, the main characteristic of, of, sorry, apologies, I'm having some difficulty. We'll just wait for um, David and IT to uh, set up. Um, Steve again. Um, maybe I'll just fill in in the interim. Um, I was interested in Tara identifying health and well-being of healthcare staff. I think today is going to be very informative in relation to that and, and to create an, a, a really positive awareness for us as, as workers to understand that these issues are out there, that there are mechanisms for coping, there are services probably underutilized currently, and that today will bring that uh, to everybody's attention. Um, which I'm just still holding here. Steve is back. Um, Steve, are you ready to go again? I am. Yeah, apologies about that. Um, there was a technical issue and then I got booted out. Um, I think it was my internet. So No problem. Thank you very much. I will, I'll just uh, go down and pick up my slides. Just stop sharing just one second. Apologies. That's okay. I'll just interject here for a second as well to take the opportunity while we have the time is to obviously extend as national chair of the operating department room section to extend my sincere thank you to the section officers 
Um, all of this doesn't happen uh, on a whim. And we have uh, had Liz Waters, Sandra Morton and Teresa Herity as the backbone of the, the section for many a year now. And I'd like to, to thank them formally today for all their support, but all the hard work that actually goes on behind the scenes in uh, maintaining the service uh, for the member to be able to access issues. So I'll hand you back to Steve now. Thank you. Yeah, apologies about the technical uh, issues. So I suppose burnout is uh, a syndrome that occurs mainly in people that work with other people. I mean, most of the research in the area of uh, burnout um, or at least the original research, was carried out um, uh, on nurses and midwives, predominantly nurses, people like Christina Maslach in the 1980s would have, um, would have done most of the research around nurses. Um, that has changed and evolved and developed, um, so it goes beyond just nurses now, but it's, it sort of expands into anybody that works with people. Um, and I suppose one of the things that is closely linked with is um, emotional labour because nurses are emotional laborers and people that interact with people um, have to carry that burden of emotion, particularly, particularly nurses. So it's very much linked to that issue of um, emotional distress. Um, and uh, I suppose the, the, the challenges around surface acting as well. So that notion that we have to act in a certain way um, that is congruent with our um, role um, as a healthcare professional. But in reality, underneath, we're actually having to deal th with things emotionally and psychologically. And unless we manage those, what tends to happen then, they will take their toll over time and have a, um, a long-term um, impact. So that issue of nurses being emotional laborers is an important um, consideration. So just to say something very quick about work engagement, and you often you see the term engagement used um, quite a lot within healthcare, just to say that the word engagement means different things to different people. So when you usually see it, particularly in the health service executive when it's used, it's usually from a very particular uh, perspective. Usually it's not evidence-based. Um, usually it's coming from a practitioner base rather than uh, an ev evidence base. So what I want to just sort of just um, highlight is something called work engagement. And it's important the word work before the engagement. This is a concept that developed in the early 2000s. Um, it is originally developed as the polar opposite, the uh, antipode of burnout. So that's the way it was developed by people like Wilma Schiffelli. Um, Christina Maslach was also um, in, involved, Michael Lita in, in Canada. And we can see that the main components of work engagement are directly the opposite of, um, of burnout. So burnout is exhaustion, inefficiency, and cynicism. Whereas work engagement is energy or vigor, absorption, and dedication. Now, some people argue it's not the polar opposite. So that is a debate that goes on um, uh, uh, around that. So there's a link between the two concepts, work engagement and, uh, and burnout. One of the things to highlight around burnout, and the analogy of the burnout matches is often uh, given um, as uh, a sort of representation of burnout. And this is a great representation because um, the important thing is, and you know in the definition, that vigor or energy is an important component of engagement. So to be burned out, you have to have burned brightly from the beginning. So, so at some point, you have to have given everything and expended all of your energy till you get to the point where there is nothing left. And that's why we see, in terms of this picture, moving from the, the match, the full, the, you know, the full match to the bird age. Um, people like Freudenberg and North in the early 1990s defined 12 phases of burnout. Um, this gives us an idea of the journey that somebody is on and also the potential in terms of identifying people um, early on in the workplace or even within ourselves. Um, what uh, burnout might be manifesting as. So we can see that it starts off as a sort of compulsion to prove yourself, to actually show that you can do better and you can do more, even though you're under stress, you can actually perform and keep going because you're the consummate professional and nothing knocks you back. So you work harder, you start to neglect your own physical, psychological, 
and emotional needs. You displace any conflicts. So you try not to engage with conflicts and you internalize them. You try and keep that uh, positive professional out of shell. You start to revise your own values in terms of what's important. Um, then you start to deny problems. So this is closely linked to what, um, what Taro was talking about as a sort of, as a coping mechanism, a negative coping mechanism of denial. You start to withdraw, you start to, you can see behavioral changes within individuals, people become depersonalized. So they sort of separate their emotions from what's going on in terms of the world and sort of that inner emptiness develops. That's important because if you look at things such as the Mid-Staffordshire Inquiry, nurses uh, or some nurses were described as callous and indifferent, um, that they were cruel. Um, which seems completely opposite to the notion of a comparing and compassionate workforce. So what I would argue is that many of those nurses um, were likely to have been um, experiencing um, burnout and this sort of depersonalization or in an emptiness. So this leads to depression and the overall burnout uh, syndrome. So this is of interest because it allows us to identify within ourselves and also our colleagues and others different signs of burnout. So the uh, model that's usually used is one of stress and demands. So there's a uh, heightened uh, demands lead to reduced energy and have a negative impact on organizational outcomes. Whereas increasing resources, whether they're personal resources or tangible physical resources, um, lead to an increase in motivation and um, have a positive impact on organizational outcomes. So this works both for work engagement, which is very much around job resources, and burnout, which is the negative side, which is around too many demands. So those demands can be um, sort of workload, or it could be emotional demands as well might be um, also uh, a characteristic. So um, the way that we usually um, deal with those demands is to draw upon coping mechanisms and Tara highlighted a whole range of different coping mechanisms that uh, the weekend uh, the weekend draw sorry I should have said that I made a, an error what I should have said is that they're the resources that we uh, that we draw upon um, so just to, to just highlight two other concepts, and these were also tapped into by both um, by both Bruce and um, Tara, which is the idea of spillover and crossover. So this is quite closely related to burnout and work engagement. So spillover refers to the transmission of experiences between domains. So this is where we have difficulties in our life outside of work that transfer over, they spill over into the workplace. Um, and vice versa, work issues spill over into home life as well. We also have crossover where we have uh, where an individual is feeling burned out, is feeling stressed, that has a contagion effect. So that can spread throughout the whole of the team quite rapidly. And equally, a positive work environment, an engaged individual is likely also to have a, a, a contagion effect as well. So the key message here is to say that an individual who is being who is experiencing burnout, um, that's an issue for the whole team. That's an issue for the organisation. And where people, um, what we shouldn't expect is that um, the people leave their emotions and their issues at the door of the hospital or their workplace as well. Issues that people have to deal with in their life can spill over into the workplace as well. There's the contagion effect. So we carried out a study last year um, in the context of COVID-19. We were interested in the psychological aspects of burnout, emotional labour, compassion, fatigue, and moral distress as well. So we carried out an online survey of nurses and midwives in Ireland. Um, we looked at demographic information and we measured th three different areas and also some general questions. So the general questions were on um, COVID-19, and we looked at impact of event scale, um, which is a proxy for post-traumatic stress. And we also uh, looked at burnout using a, a very new scale, which was developed by Schaefeli and colleagues who are leaders in burnout and work engagement in uh, Ultrecht University in uh, the Netherlands. And we also looked at ProQual, professional quality of life. But I'm only just going to focus on the, the burnout aspect um, just for the rest of the session. 
So just some general information. Um, I'm going to be talking about mainly about the survey last year, but we're also conducting a survey right now, and I'm giving you some of the results um, as they're sort of coming in. So the response rate last year was uh, 2,642 nurses, and currently we have nearly 1,300 uh, respondents, um, mainly female respondents, 96%. Um, the highest number were registered general nurses, but you can see a representation across the um, sections of the register as well. So one of the things we asked in 2020, um, and I will highlight when I'm talking about 2021 results, uh, did you or do you care for patients with COVID-19? And we see three quarters of the respondents cared for patients with COVID-19. So this was, um, you know, was a reflection uh, of the impact of COVID-19 and its implications of burnout. Did you contract COVID-19? Um, the majority didn't last year in September when we carried out the survey. So 88% didn't. But of the 12%, when we asked them, have they experienced the long-term effects? We can see 73% um, were physical effects of COVID-19 still. And that idea of long COVID and the long-term implications um, was very much an emerging issue and continues to be an issue for healthcare workers um, who've um, experienced COVID-19 COVID uh, themselves. So we asked, do you believe that your experience of COVID-19, and this is probably one of the most important questions, had a negative impact on you, a negative psychological impact? And what we can see is 83% in 2020 reported that yes, it did. And when we ask the same question this year, what we can see is 85%. So it's roughly the same, slightly increased. So that's why psychological impact of COVID-19 on nurse and midwives is an important issue and continues to be an important uh, issue. Do you believe that it impacted your colleagues as well? Now, when we're referring to colleagues, we can see that it jumps up to 95% in 2020 and 97% currently are the results within Ireland. So again, underline this is a real key, key issue. These are some of the experiences um, of um, nurse and midwives when off duty, that they experience forgetfulness. They have difficulty in intending and focusing, so it's having an attentional issue. So they were probably thinking about other things, sort of competing thoughts in terms of what was going on. Trouble concentrating. So many of these are very much cognitive um, issues. And a key one there is mental exhaustion. And we're hitting sort of over the 90% reported mental exhaustion. And if you think back, the key element of burnout, it's exhaustion. Mental exhaustion is the key component of burnout. Has your experience of working during COVID considered, uh, caused you to consider leaving the profession? So this was quite a remarkable and shocking result for us. We didn't expect this level of consideration to leave the profession. In 2020, 61% of respondents had considered leaving the professions. Now, even more surprising, this year, in um, as, as we're currently carrying out the survey, the current results are coming back as 67% have considered leaving the profession. So this is not just a, an artifact of last year, it continues to be an issue. And in the middle of both the, of the continual um, pandemic, but also in the global shortage of nurses, um, which it seems like is only going to be more challenging in the next five or six years. This is a real issue that needs to be um, considered um, nationally and internationally. So in 2021, we also asked a different question as well. So it's one thing saying, did you consider, but do you intend to leave in the last 12 months? So in 2020, the current results are actually telling us that a quarter of nurses and midwives that responded to the survey said they are likely or very likely to leave the professions in the next 12 months. So again, sending a clear message, and this has been reported internationally by the um, ICN, um, that there's an expectation that the professions will uh, hemorrhage uh, members in the next 12 months once um, the pandemic is over or is controlled. 
So they're uh, another shocking and uh, important finding that probably needs to be highlighted. Now, these results are very similar to what um, Tara posted. Some of them are almost very similar questions. Um, this is uh, staff stated whether they agree or disagree with the following statements. I've experienced stress in securing um, child care. So strongly agree is in the blue and the orange, and we can see over 20, well, approaching 30% um, report that they had experienced problems. Experienced stress about the risk of spreading infection. And what we're seeing there is sort of um, in excess of 80%, moving up to 90%. I'm confident in my employer's abilities. Well, thankfully, um, we can see that sort of um, there was sort of near 50%, but the worrying thing is that is over 50%, either in the gray, yellow or light blue area, um, that are not confident in the ability of the employer to keep them safe due to the uncertainty of the emerging virus. Um, correct PP, PP is always available. We can see um, approaching a third um, reported that it wasn't. Again, another surprising finding. I feel that my personal health is at risk. Um, and we can see there over 80% reported that they did. So all of these issues are likely to add to the demands upon the individual resulting in, in stress. So I'm just gonna uh, just go through just some of the highlights just in terms of the, um, the results. So we use the, uh, the BAT, the Burnout Assessment Tool from Schaffelli and colleagues, 2020. Um, it has four subscales, exhaustion, mental distance, cognitive impairment, and emotional impairment, and one additional um, uh, secondary scale. I'm going to focus mainly on the four um, core scales. So this one is around the total score. So this is the whole thing around burnout, um, adding all of the different dimensions. And we can see that the, um, the overall uh, mean score was uh, 2.91. And just to highlight that um, the results um, have been um, uh, set on a scale that highlights whether they're high, low, or very high. And the reports uh, that we, we found from the results were that the results were in the high level in terms of total burnout reported by nurses in September 2020. When we look at exhaustion, we can also see the um, the mean score also is within the high um, category for burnout exhaustion. So again, a clear indication of how exhausted mentally um, nurse and midwives were. And again, mental distance. So this is the separation that uh, the person has. So again, if you go back to Freudenberger and North, in terms of that sort of emergent to trying to keep yourself distant from what was happening as a cognitive coping mechanism. Um, we can see that's also high. Cognitive impairment, this is slightly lower. It's pitched at sort of average. So actually, when you look at the, what would be considered a high score is 2.6. What actually was the mean score was 2.49. So it's edging um, close to um, high in terms of cognitive impairment. Again, that would be very similar to the ideas of attention and forgetfulness as well. And just the final one here is emotional impairment. Again, um, was uh, ranked uh, the mean score as also high um, as well on the BAT um, score. So there's a clear message here that is saying that burnout was a factor and, continue, and we are expecting it will continue to be a factor um, that has been heightened by COVID-19. It's important to say and underline um, that even before COVID-19, these figures would also have been reported high um, internationally, not in the last couple of years, but also over decades. So what can be done? So quite often the focus is on what the individual can do, building their resilience, building coping strategies. And all of those things are important um, in terms of drawn upon resources like employee assisted programs that are provided by the HSE or by employers. Meditation, it might be in terms of um, support groups. It might be activities such as that have been promoted by the Point of Care Foundation, such as SWAR trains, where staff meet together to discuss issues of concern about themselves rather than patient care or stress management. 
Now, the only thing to say in relation to all of these, they're all useful and they all have a place to part, a place to, uh, a part to play in terms of managing burnout. But if we look at the example of stress management, if we consider that stress is a product of the work environment, by sending somebody off to develop coping mechanisms around stress management, and then fixing the person by sending them on a program, um, when they come back into the work environment, um, you know, it's likely they're exposed to the same levels of stress. So it's almost as if we've placed the burden of trying to um, manage the stress on the individual rather than changing the work environment. And that's an important message that um, it's important that the employer, the work environment needs to change to overcome some of these um, problems that nurses and midwives are faced with. At an individual level, um, organizations have provided resources, counseling resources, psychological support resources over the last 12 months. One example um, from the INMO is the Let's Talk About um, resource that's been developed, which is a, uh, a resource that's been developed jointly with, uh, with, um, with Core Market. And I'm just going to come to the end. I just want to highlight just one other type of coping mechanism. Um, that people often use, or it's one to, to encourage work engagement more so, is something called job craft. So one of the techniques for increasing engagement for an individual is to craft jobs so that they do the job that they want to do. And you'll probably come across people who are employed to do one thing, and within six months, you find that they're doing something that they prefer. So that's probably one of the best techniques for improving engagement for yourself. Look at what you're good at, look at what your strengths are, craft, craft the job to, um, to, uh, to, to do things that you want to do. So just as an overall statement, having said that about individuals, um, it's just to highlight and underline that if the problem is, problem is with the workplace, um, the organization or the health system, then the problem and solution resides within the workplace and the health system and shouldn't be put on the shoulders of the individual. No amount of individual or group training and coping resources will solve the problem. If there are too many demands, um, the individual is not going to be able to cope with those. So those issues need to be dealt with at an organizational level. And just my concluding comments is that we need to continually be mindful of the impact um, psychological impact of COVID-19 on nurse and midwives, even when the, um, and hopefully it will happen and soon the pandemic uh, dissipates, um, that there will be longer term consequences for nurses and midwives. It is important that we monitor both the continued short term and long term impact of COVID-19, psychological and physical. So given the recognition to the long COVID impact. And action must be taken to balance the demands uh, on nurse and midwives to ensure adequate uh, organizational resources um, are employed to prevent stress and burnout, um, provide support, um, and, individual, and to ensure that individuals are supported as well. And my final uh, comment is that um, in 2016, um, similar to many health uh, services throughout the world. Um, nursing um, regulatory and nursing statutory organizations reaffirmed the, uh, the uh, around ethics, but re reaffirmed the values of nurses and midwives on the back of many of the scandals that occurred, like Mid Staffordshire, like Morecambe Bay, um, and we have many similar ones in, in Ireland as well. They reaffirmed what those values were compassion, care, and commitment. Um, often, we often see those as referring only to the people that we serve and that we care for. But we shouldn't forget that if we expect nurses and midwives and other healthcare workers and professionals um, to care for, um, for others in a compassionate and caring way, we should expect that our employers also um, care for us in a compassionate and caring and committed way. And we should do that in terms of our colleagues um, as well. Um, so that's it. Hopefully it was of interest just to say that the survey is still ongoing, the 21 th 20, 2021 survey, and we will publish those results probably in, in September. 
uh, once they become available. Last year's results were published in November, World Virish Nurse. Thank you very much for that, Steve. Um, that was really informative. Um, again, it creates that awareness. I know we're all in the workplace and we understand we're stressed, but the evidence um, give us, gives us the confidence and empowers us to say, this can't continue, we need to address these issues. Um, psychosocial risk assessments are going to be very important, are now, but are going to be very important that they're given the recognition that they deserve um, going forward. Mid Staffordshire, um, Steve, in reflecting on that, I remember reading through the Francis report, etc., a number of years ago, and being shocked by the impact that burnout has on people. And we must be really vigilant that we don't allow that. We have the skill set, we have the knowledge. Um, as members engage in these surveys, it's really important because they are creating a foundation for our colleagues going forward. They're creating a recognition around this and the evidence that we can challenge situations and to make improvements. Uh, and individually as a nurse, I can recognize many of the phases uh, and I'm sure my colleagues online today will recognize many of the faces that you have suggested are characteristics of contributing factors to burnout. And I think creating that awareness for ourselves makes us uh, um, more in tune with, with what, how we manage our working lives. We go into work, I suppose, every day and we factor in our professional code of conduct and our scope of practice. And I think as we move forward, as a group and as a compassionate group that we need to spend, afford a similar amount of time um, on ourselves, factoring in how we manage our work so that we can work. And I use the word happy and content. It's really important that we, our job should be giving us that. We should be getting that feedback from our workplaces. So um, finally, from my perspective, I would concur entirely with what Steve has alluded to in relation to causation. Um, it is really important through this evidence gathering, et cetera, that, that we can produce this evidence to take forward and make improvements. If we don't improve the causation at organisational level, if it's in the workplace, it's going to be very difficult to manage as we go forward. And there are a number of um, activities and resources and sources that we can utilise. Um, and I'll discuss that with uh, before we have our next speaker. I'd just like to ask Sandra then. Um, is there, do you have any questions uh, for Steve? There's no questions at the moment and I'm not hold things up by asking anymore. Okay, that's lovely. So then thank Karen, you. Oh, Karen, can I just mention one thing? You mentioned the word happiness and I think that's a, an important uh, area because there's a lot of interest in happiness. And people like Martin Seligman, who are probably the key writers in that area, would argue that the most sustainable type of um, happiness and long lasting type is where we give back to others and we make a major contribution in terms of society and, and to others generally. Um, and it's, it's interesting that the nursing and midwifery professions fit um, that category almost perfectly. So there seems to be a complete mismatch somewhere in terms of what the job offers and what actually happens in, in reality as well. So um, nursing should be a job that people are flocking to and also staying in. So there's something that needs to be done in terms of trying to understand why that's not the case. Lovely, Steve. Thank you very much for that.